year, we saw a lot of very bad quarterback play across the league, I must say, in week one. Um, dozens of quarterbacks not even being able to throw for 200 yards in the opening week. Uh, just across the board, kind of unimpressive. Uh, now, there's a lot of theories for why this could be. Uh, some people have speculated it's because of the shorter preseason time. Cutting it from four to three last two years, we've seen a big dip in the number of opening week touchdown passes thrown. So maybe that has to explain it. But our top five quarterback finishes this week were at number one, Josh Allen with 31.2 fantasy points. Then at number two, Baker Mayfield at 29.7 fantasy points. Number three, Jaden Daniels coming in at 28.2 points. Uh, number four, Anthony Richardson with 26.1 points. And number five, finally, Lamar Jackson with 25.1 fantasy points. Now, of this top five, I must say, four of these do not come as a surprise. Josh Allen, Jaden Daniels, Anthony Richardson, Lamar Jackson, these are all dual threat quarterbacks that were going very highly off of uh, fantasy boards. Even though Jaden Daniels was not going high off fantasy boards, I was recommending him a lot, and a lot of people were pretty high on him as a rookie just because of his rushing ability. And he tended to prove everyone right in that regard, rushing, I think, 16 times for 88 yards and two touchdowns. So if you are not aware, now you know. Uh, anyway, with that, I will say that Baker Mayfield did does come on here as a surprise just because he is more so of a pocket passer. Not saying that he can't run the ball, he does pick up a couple first first downs on his feet every once in a while, and he is able to run with it, but that's not exactly what he's known for. Uh, but he played an absolutely wonderful game against the Commanders, slicing and dicing their secondary. Uh, ended up going 24 of 30 for 289 into four passing touchdowns. Now, I don't know how much he can maintain of that, but this Buccaneers offense does look like it's ready to sustain it to fantasy wide receiver one type talents once again, uh, but we'll have to see. After that, let's talk about the lead running backs this week. Coming in at number one, we had Saquon Barkley in his debut with the Eagles, uh, getting 33.2 fantasy points. This came off 109 yards rushing, two touchdowns, and then two catches for 23 yards and a touchdown. Then we had Joe Mixon on his new team, then Houston, Texas, getting 159 rush yards, one touchdown, three catches for 19 yards, totaling for 26.8 fantasy points, but this game on 30 carries, so we might see a giant workload for Joe Mixon this year. Then we have Devon A. Jan of the Miami Dolphins coming in in third with 23 fantasy points. Uh, he had 24 rush yards. Very different from his production last year. Last year he was one of the most efficient guys, completely blocked in the running game, but whatever he couldn't make up on the ground, he was able to produce through the air. Uh, ended up catching seven passes for 76 yards, and he did get a rushing touchdown, so still had a great day, even though it wasn't efficient at all. And then we had J.K. Dobbins of the Los Angeles Chargers with 135 rush yards on only 10 rushes uh, and a touchdown. Along with that, he had three catches for four yards. So he comes in fourth with 22.9 points. And then finally, a late inactive marking for Christian McCaffrey on Monday night meant that Jordan Mason got the starting ball in he flourished in it, getting 28 carries, uh, compiling 147 rush yards for one touchdown, and also adding one catch for five yards. So, there you have your top five. Um, three of these guys being running backs on a new team to start off the season. So, nice to see them thriving in their new locations. I will say, of this list, the most surprising to me is J.K. Dobbins, just because... I had not been high on him in the offseason. I have never really spoken highly about him. It's not that I'm talking down on him. Uh, he's just been pretty in injury prone, and I have never felt inclined to go get him. So, uh, you know, very efficient day from him. Good for him. Um, we'll see if it persists. Now, let's transition into the week one wide receivers. Coming in at first with 33.1 fantasy points, we have Jaden Reed of the Packers. He had 33 
rush yards, any rushing touchdown, along with four catches for 138 yards, any touchdown. Then on the Rams, we saw the return of old-fashioned Cooper Cup, finishing with 32 fantasy points on, uh, I believe it was 21 targets, 14 catches, 110 yards, one touchdown, and 10 rush yards. Then third place, we have Jets wide receiver that we're all expecting to make this board, and that's right, Alan Lazard with six catches for 89 yards and two touchdowns, uh, one of them being a garbage time touchdown, but still very productive day from him nonetheless. Uh, he got 26.9 fantasy points in his debut. Actually, it wasn't his debut, it was uh, in, in his first game with Aaron Rodgers on the Jets. Then we've got Tyreek Hill of the Miami Dolphins scoring 26 points uh, just a few, uh, a few hours after being detained and arrested by Miami uh, Dodd Police Department in an altercation, or not an altercation, but in an incident that's very bustling. Um, I guess it seems like he was pulled over and um, they wanted him to roll down his window and he was not, and then they fully arrested him. So kind of a scary interaction for him, but he was able to, you know, be able to play in the game, and he had seven catches for 130 yards and a touchdown. Finally, coming in at fifth, we have, once again, a wide receiver we're expecting from the Lions to be on this team, uh, on this list, Jamison Williams, yes, he had 13 rush yards, five catches for 121 yards, and a touchdown, finishing in fifth with 24.4 fantasy points. Then let's transition into the tight ends, and I have to say, this is probably the worst week for tight ends I have ever seen in my life. I can't remember the last time tight end play was this exceptionally poor. Uh, absolutely no notable performances outside of Isaiah Likely, who went off on Thursday Night Football. He finished with nine catches for 111 yards and one touchdown, getting a total of 26.1 fantasy points. Easily could have been over a 30-point night for him if that last touchdown had counted as well. Then we have a huge drop-off to Foster Moreau of the New Orleans Saints. He had a solid game with four catches for 43 yards and a touchdown, but he only recorded 14.3 fantasy points, and that was good enough for the number two finish on the week. Then we've got rookie Brock Bowers of the Las Vegas Raiders, who had six catches for 58 yards in his Oakland, or sorry, in his Vegas Raiders debut. Uh, coming in at fourth, we have Kyle Pitts, who, you know, is proving that he is a top tight end in the league with this outing. He got three passes for 26 yards and a touchdown. Uh, giving him 11.6 fantasy points. Good enough for fourth. And then finally, we have Juwan Johnson of the New Orleans Saints as well, who had two catches for 26 yards and a touchdown, totaling for 10.6 fantasy points. And that is how bad fantasy play was. The fifth tight end on the, on the week barely cracked 10 points. Um, so all the big names pretty much having a bust week. The only top tight end prospect even having a salvageable week was Kyle Pitts, so there you have it. <laughs> After that, we can talk about the defenses this week. Uh, the number one defense on the week would be that of the Chicago Bears. They played against the Tennessee Titans, and we saw Will Levis make some of the silliest passes I have ever seen, and it led to an amazing quote from his head coach. I believe the head coach, after the game, said, we probably could have won this game if we had just punted the ball every time it was first and ten. Uh, I think he means in the second half, because they had a 17-point lead, and yeah, he wouldn't have been wrong. So, <laughs> that is the harsh truth. The Bears' defense capitalizes off of Will Levis' stupidity, <laughs> scoring two touchdowns, two interceptions, one fumble recovery, three sacks, one block punt, and only allowing 17 points. After that, we have the Minnesota Vikings, who were playing against the New York Giants. Uh, they profited off of Daniel Jones' inability to throw a football. They scored one touchdown, two interceptions, five sacks, and only allowed six points in the game. And we've got the Dallas Cowboys, who played some pretty fierce competition in the Cleveland Browns, but the Browns did not show up to play. The Cowboys end up with one touchdown, two interceptions, six sacks, and only allowed 17 points, one of them coming, uh, I believe, with like 30 seconds left in the game. Realistically, it was 
because of uh, a tweaked hamstring that he has been dealing with. So those are the key inactives on the week. After that, I think we are finally ready to talk about our week two waiver wire. So as I explain these things, um, I might put up some graphs, graphs for you. I think for right now I'll just talk <laughs> and see how it goes. So heading into week two, these are my waiver wire additions for your fantasy team uh, to help you try and win as the coming weeks pass. We've got first up the quarterback position, three recommendations for you. Number one would be Baker Mayfield himself finished as a quarterback two in fantasy this week. Um, showcase that he still has the ability to throw for four touchdowns. Igniting this Buccaneers offense doesn't look like Mike Evans or Chris Godwins have uh, regressed or slowed down in any way, shape, or form. Now, I don't expect every week Baker Mayfield to be able to complete 80% of his passes or throw for four touchdowns, but he did also manage to pick up 21 yards on the ground, rushing in a couple times, so you're getting a little bit of rushing ability. A guy who seemingly can throw multiple touchdowns in a loaded wide receiver room, even uh, Jalen McMillan went out for a touchdown in that game, so all of them look solid. I think the offensive line looked pretty good. We could see a fantasy relevant year for Baker Mayfield, and he put everyone on notice with that week one performance. Then, next up, I have Geno Smith on here. Geno Smith, I will say, did not have the best day as a passer, uh, starting off the game pretty rough in the first half. They did not look to be doing very well against the Broncos, uh, but you do have to keep in mind this is a new offensive scheme with Ryan Grubb, new offensive coach, new coach, new head coach with Mike McDonald, and so a lot of change for the Seahawks offense, but in the second half, they were able to pick it up, turn it around, eventually get that victory, and put up 26 points. In this game, Geno Smith only threw for like 176 yards, I believe, uh, but we have to keep in mind that he's going to be playing with Tyler Lockett, DK Metcalf, uh, JSN, and he also managed to pick up 30 yards on the ground and score a rushing touchdown in this game, so we know that his wide receiver room is absolutely packed if Geno also has this light scrambling ability and the ability to pick up a rushing touchdown here and there, then his upside cannot be overstated. I think that Geno Smith, maybe not in this following week, but in the future, could prove to be a very viable streaming option from the quarterback position. And then finally, let's talk about Justin Fields off the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now, Mike Tomlin is non-committal on who is going to start in week two. I think someone tried to ask him in a post-game presser, and his answer was, that's a question for Tuesday. Today is Tuesday. I didn't really hear anything. Uh, but Justin Fields in the start against Atlanta. Steelers offense didn't look amazing. They did not score an offensive touchdown. But the key thing here is Fields did not... Uh, have any mistakes, no major mistakes. He had no turnovers, and I think that is a plus for him. He completed 74% of his throws, which is quite high. Um, and most important of the factors is that he rushed the ball 14 times. Now, in his 14 rushes, he only got like 57 or so yards, but not every defense is going to be as stingy. I think that if he's going to rush the ball that many times, he could have a day that is much more productive, um, rushing in for a touchdown and getting something more like 70 yards, and that is upside that we don't want to be ignoring. Uh, I, I feel like at some point, this offense will score a touchdown. I don't know when it is. They weren't very good at it in the preseason. They didn't seem to be able to do it in this first game. But uh, the Falcons' defense is pretty solid. So uh, they were able to get the victory here. If they decide to go with Fields again in the future, I would consider rostering him just because of his rushing upside. And yeah. After that, we can talk about the running backs in this upcoming week, this upcoming waiver wire period. Now I've got three running backs that I think could be added to your team and give you an instant impact. And then I've got three more running backs that are more so on handcuff watch, you could say. So, first up, uh, we're going to talk about Jordan Mason of the San Francisco 49ers. Now, this is the guy who was filling in for Christian McCaffrey, and he had a tremendous workload. 28 carries in week one, the most that Kyle Shanahan has ever given. 
given to a running back in his tenure with the 49ers, uh, and the second most of any running back on the week behind Joe Mixon. So I don't know if that's going to be a weekly occurrence, but Jordan Mason handled it extremely well, uh, getting a top five fantasy finish in his first ever start. And if Christian McCaffrey happens to miss another week, then you definitely want to be playing Jordan Mason because he has shown he can handle a three down roll uh, in the game. They also talked about how he has worked extensively on his abilities in the passing game, so we might even see a little more production in the passing game from him. He only had one catch for five yards, but if that number goes up, uh, he truly can do it all, and this is a great O-line for the San Francisco 49ers, great offense. Uh, you know that they, when Christian McCaffrey was here, is scoring a rushing touchdown every week, so go out and get Jordan Mason if he is available in your league. Then number two, we have Justice Hill of the Baltimore Ravens. Justice Hill, he saw the most targets of any running back in the league this week. Uh, not only that, he also had a very high target share. You know, target share is the percentage of the passes that a quarterback throws at their tight ends, their wide receivers, and their running backs. He was able to manage to gather a 20% target share, which is quite high uh, for even for a wide receiver. That's like pretty solid. But to get that as a running back is huge. 20% uh, target share for Justice Hill. Not only that, he was also the only running back involved for the Ravens during the two-minute drill. Um, that that won't always be the case. I think that they will change it up. But John Harbaugh did say that it's not really the plan to give Derek Henry Henry uh, 30 touches a week. So the fact that he's doubling down on this low usage, low usage game plan for Derrick Henry, uh, I would be concerned. I don't think it makes sense to bring him in and not use him. Maybe he just means 20 touches because he only saw 13. Um, but Justice Hill considering how targeted he was in that passing game, he is a, is a must-add addition because I see it likely uh, save flowers. And then he, he was the third biggest component of that offense, catching a lot of passes by the yard, by the line of scrimmage, screen passes, dump offs. So yeah, I would go out and get him. And then finally, I think the biggest surprise in week one was Alexander Madison of the Las Vegas Raiders. Now, everyone knew that Samir White was going to have some role on this offense, and I think everyone expected it to be a much bigger one, uh, serving as like the workhorse back early first down, second down. Maybe Alexander Madison coming in on third down to deal more with the passing game, but Alexander Madison actually out snapped Samir White. 36 to 23 for the Vegas Raiders, um, and he came in dying for second in targets among running backs. So those are huge. Uh, not only does that mean that this is like a certified committee, but it also means he's at the forefront of the committee. Um, and the six targets that he saw is, you know, not negligible. Six is tied for some of the highest in the league. So if he is available uh, in your league, you could be getting a guy that is, you know, RB1 for the Raiders. Um, now obviously he's not going to do most of the rushing for them, but those quarterbacks are going to need bailout passes, so we could see that as a consistent six targets. Now let's move into the more handcuff options that you might want to consider rostering if you have an extra spot. I don't know if they're going to be immediately impactful, but if the main running back in this room happens to go down, then you're in for a nice treat. So first up, we've got um, Bucky Irving of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Bucky Irving only saw nine carries in this game, but also two targets. Uh, it's I think he had nine carries to Rajon White's 15, so it's not like he's outpacing him in any way, but it's what he did with his carries that kind of sticks out. Um, Rajon White, you know, notoriously inefficient in the running game. That was on full display. Uh, he got, I think, 31 yards on 15 carries, averaging two yards per carry. Bucky Irving, on the other hand, 
got a nine carries, got over 63 yards, so averaging seven yards per carry, which is amazing. Um, I didn't know that we could see that out of a running back in Tampa Bay. So with the impressive showcase in week one, we could see Buggy Irving more involved in the early down role. They have been very finicky about his usage uh, in terms of the way that Todd Bowles and the offensive coordinator talks about Buggy Irving's involvement. Some guys are saying that Rajad White will be the main guy. Some are saying we're going to use our guys when we see fit, but definitely a guy to keep your eyes on. Then at number two, we've got Tank Bixby of the Jacksonville Jaguars. Now this one hurts a little bit because I was talking about how last year he didn't get into Etienne's workload at all, but it might not be the case this year. Um, in the game against the Dolphins, both Etienne and Tank Bixby got the same number of carries, which is a bit worrisome, uh, at 12 totes each. And the thing here is very similar. You know, Etienne, I think, was averaging six. 3.7 yards per carry, not efficient at all, whereas Tanks Bigsby finished with 6.7 yards per carry on the same number of touches um, as a rusher, not as a receiver. He did not get any volume in the receiving game, so as of right now, no real standalone value, but if Etienne goes down, then he's cut out for a huge role. Then, finally, we've got Jaleel McLaughlin of the Denver Broncos. Jaleel, he actually out-touched Javante Williams in the opener. He had five targets in five catches, and I believe ten, ru ten rushing attempts in game one. But uh, not the most impressive showcase is five catches totaled from one yard, and I think his ten rushes were for 27 yards, and then he lost a fumble. So, very bad day for him, fantasy-wise, but the volume is indicative of not a one-man show. It's not going to be Javante Williams running everything. Um, obviously, he wasn't very efficient, but the five targets is not something that we can overlook. You know, Bo Nix is going to need help. He might be targeting this running back quite often, and so if Jaleel McLaughlin can be slightly more efficient, then he could be somewhat salvageable. It also depends on his ability to gain yards, but yeah, the five yards, I believe, or sorry, the five targets would be good enough for fourth uh, amongst all running backs. And yeah, the fact that he out-touched Javante Williams is also something to consider. So, horrible week from him, but keep your eyes open in case... Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Anyway, after that, let's talk about wider receivers. In the wide receiver department, I've got five guys for you. Number one, we have Wandell Robinson from the New York Giants. Now, I won't lie to you, the New York Giants offense did look like a dumpster fire on Sunday, but from that horrible group, you had Malik Neighbors with a solid opening day. Uh, but the thing that was the most surprising was the way that Wandell Robinson was utilized. Not only did we see him uh, record a carry, he had 12 targets in game one. 12 targets being good enough to die for second place in the entire league, coming second only to Cooper Cup. So that um, was good enough to tie with like the means of Tyreek Hill. That is volume that absolutely cannot be ignored. Uh, why Daniel Jones wanted to target him so much, I have no clue. But he had a 31% target share, which is incomprehensible for for anyone. Really, I would have expected Malik Neighbors to have numbers like this, but maybe it was Malik Neighbors drawing the main defensive threat. Uh, this is why Wanda Robinson was like this. I don't know. I I would be a little cautious because Daniel Jones is he looked horrible. He looked straight up not good, but. We've also seen him be not as bad as he was on Sunday. So, Wanda Robinson, you know, maybe stash him. At least keep your eyes open for him because second most targets in the league. That's not something you can ignore. Then, at number two, we've got Alan Lazard of the New York Jets. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Alan Lazard was a top five finisher on this first week of fantasy. Uh, the most 
most notable things about him, he played 100% of the offensive snaps for the Jets. Um, you know, the main difference between him and Garrett Wilson being that Garrett Wilson was taken out once the Jets fell down big and they were playing garbage time with Tyrod Taylor, but Alan Lazard getting a lot of well-needed reps. You know, he got a touchdown from Aaron Rodgers. He also got a touchdown from Tyrod Taylor, so that boosted his game a little bit, but overall, we saw Rodgers target him on an early pass, uh, I think the first pass of the game, then uh, go to him on a touchdown look, and he had a 31% tar percent target share over the entire game, and was a top 5 finisher, I think that at least warrants him being on rosters heading forward. Then third, we've got Greg Dorch of the Arizona Cardinals, Greg Dorch kind of a surprise addition to this list, because, you know, with the fourth overall pick, the Cardinals added Marvin Harrison Jr., and even though Marvin Harrison Jr. ran, like, a route on 94% of offensive snaps, he had one catch for four yards, uh, three total targets, was completely invisible in his opening game, horrible debut, and uh, images are coming out of Kyler Murray completely missing him on what would have been a game time or game game-winning touchdown uh, for the Arizona Cardinals, so absolutely tough break for him. I'm sure that his future looks brighter, but until then, we have Greg Dorch. Greg Dorch in week one led the entire Cardinals offense in targets, so this even includes uh, tight end Trey McBride. He saw a 26% target share, and at the very end of the game, when I happened to tune in, it seemed like he was the go-to guy. Kyler Murray in clutch time, uh, even being the target of what would have been a fourth down attempt to try and tie the game. So, Greg George, definitely a trusted entity for Kyler Murray. He had a pretty nice opening stretch to the season last year. We could be seeing something similar for him again this year. Then, coming in at number four, we've got Demarcus Robinson for the Los Angeles Rams. Uh, oh, know how I forgot. Obviously one of the biggest injuries of week one uh, that I don't know how I missed. Uh, Bukunikua, Bukunikua has suffered a MCL sprain as well. Uh, something like that. Something in his knee. Uh, either way, he has been placed on IR and he will be m missing at least four games. Uh, that is why we saw such a rise to Cooper Cup's value once again. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know how I missed that, but yes, Bukunikua will not be available for the next four weeks, meaning that we see a bump to these other guys on the Rams offense. Now, Demarcus Robinson, why he's a candidate for a bump, uh, simple matter of fact, is he was on the field for 92% of the offensive snaps, and in certain situations, even when Buka was available last year, we did see Demarcus Robinson pop off for some nice games. Uh, one that comes to mind is that playoff game. So Demarcus Robinson, he's had uh, nice games both with Patrick Mahomes and with Matthew Stafford. He has proven his ability to step up into a decent role, and I think that he will be uh, filling in as a wide receiver too. We did see a little more with Tyler Johnson, but Tyler Johnson was, uh, even though he's on a higher target share, he wasn't on the field as much, so I would go after Demarcus Robinson in this case. And finally, last but not least, we have... Brandon Cooks of the Dallas Cowboys. Brandon Cooks in this game saw seven targets and managed to go for, I believe, four catches, 40 yards, and a touchdown, having a very solid day for himself. Uh, but more notable than that is his vacancy of uh, John, Jake Ferguson on this offense, with Jake Ferguson looking to be the number two target on the year, now being out for a couple of weeks. Brandon Cooks having a very solid week one. Uh, we can safely assume that there's a bigger role out there for Brandon Cooks right now. He already had seven targets, which is notable in itself, but uh, Ferguson being out, that only goes up for Brandon Cooks of CD Lamb and then wide receiver one by far, but a boost to Cooks as well, who is surprisingly only aren't rostered in like 30% of leagues. Then, let us go with the tight end position. Now, this is hard for me to recommend because tight ends played so donkey doo doo in week one, uh, almost everyone was trash. So, of that group, there's only one guy that really stands out as someone that could be productive uh, in the next couple weeks that isn't already owned, and that would be Colby Parkinson of the Los Angeles Rams. Uh, after Pukunokwad went down, and I guess 
because he is the number one tight end on this team. Uh, Kobe Parkinson played 88% of snaps um, for the Rams offense, and this was tied for fifth most amongst any tight end in the league. Uh, it was also one of only eight tight ends this week to see at least five targets, and so yeah, I I really have nothing for you more than that in the tight end department. Um, so if you're in need of one, Kobe Parkinson could be a guy. Uh, other than obviously Isaiah Likely, um, Isaiah Likely, so silly of me. Uh, the number one tight end target, the number one option outside of Jordan Mason this week that you should be going and chasing. He saw the most targets of any tight end in this week with 11. He had the most catches of any tight end this week with 9. Uh, even though he is still playing on an offense with Mark Andrews, Mark Andrews saw 2 targets. And I say likely extremely athletic guy can jump, can streak down the field. So, absolutely, top priority, go get Isaiah Likely, and then if you can't get him, go get Kobe Parkinson. <laughs> anyway, after that, we can go with our three streaming defensive options on this week. Uh, coming up at number one, we have the Los Angeles Chargers. As I mentioned in a lot of my draft videos and mock draft videos, the Chargers have an extremely easy schedule to open up the season. And so, week one, we saw them faced on a Las Vegas Raiders offense. And now in week two, they get to play the Carolina Panthers. And if you missed it, the Carolina Panthers were horrible on offense. Only scored 10 points, lost 47 to 10 against the Saints. And the Saints were one of the few teams that got more fantasy points in the defensive category than the Chargers. So absolutely, they are first priority. Then, coming in at number two, uh, this is where I would plug in the Colts defense. Now the Colts defense in this week didn't do anything too spectacular. I think they only got four fantasy points, albeit they were playing a very tough Houston Texans offense. So four points in itself is somewhat impressive. The reason why I'm suggesting them to you is because with Jordan Love out and the Colts playing the Packers, this means that they get a matchup against Malik Willis. Now, I don't know if you remember the last couple of times that Malik Willis has suited up to play quarterback, but Bro can barely throw the ball. Uh, with all due respect, he is mostly a runner, and when it comes to throwing the ball, the accuracy is not there. Uh, so even though the Packers have a talented wide receiver group, I I would definitely take the gamble on the Colts defense and see how many picks Malik Willis ends up throwing. Uh, I, I don't expect the Packers to score a ton of points with them. I think that it is honestly baffling that they did not get someone else. They just got Malik Willis uh, off of the Titans a couple weeks ago. I don't think he knows the playbook, and he just does not have any good experiences in the NFL. There was rumors of the, the Packers trying to get Tannehill. I don't know what ended up as a result of those, but I do think, like, if you want to stay competitive in these next weeks with Jordan Love out, you can't be playing Malik Willis. And then finally, the third and final defense streaming option for this week that I will be suggesting to you is that of the Broncos defense. The Broncos defense tasked with a moderately challenging week one opponent in the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, they fared quite well, you know, putting up, I think, 10 fantasy points holding their ground. Uh, this defensive unit got an interception, a fumble, and two sacks. But along with that, they also were able to get two safeties on the opposing team. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't remember the last time I saw multiple safeties on the same team or even in the same game. So, very good job by the Broncos there. And now, they have the opportunity to play against the Steelers. Now, whether the Steelers are being led by Russell Wilson or Justin Fields, I still do not know. But uh, either one of them, you know, the Steelers' offense has not produced very much, and the Broncos held their own against the Seahawks. So, chances are that they can do a good job of limiting the number of points that the Steelers' offense is able to get. And, yeah, if it's Russell Wilson, he has not played yet. He's coming off a minor injury. This quarterback group did not throw for any 
touchdowns in the preseason, and they still haven't thrown for any touchdowns. Uh, now, Justin Fields is harder to defend against because he has that scrambling ability, and if he is in, maybe it's slightly worse for them. But I think that the Broncos, if you're really in need of defense, they could be valuable this week. I do think that the Seahawks were a harder task in the Steelers aren't as talented on offense. They have less guys you need to cover. Their running backs aren't as talented, in my opinion. Um, and, yeah. So, with that, we conclude our Week 1 Fantasy Football Recap and Week 2 Waiver Wire Editions. Let me know if there's anyone that you think I missed that should be uh, added to this Week 2 Waiver Wire list. Obviously, I almost skipped over very important dudes like say it likely missed out on the Bukunuku injury, so please comment down below if there's anyone that you think should be included. And yeah, uh, thanks for watching. If you enjoy content like this, feel free to like, comment, or subscribe. I'll be putting out more videos as the weeks progress. And yeah, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.